spend a minute talking about the one assignment. I think it's lab four. And I forget when it's due. I don't think it's due until next week. But um, because the reason I, I want to talk about it is it's a little bit bigger assignment. And I want you to sort of take inventory as we've been talking through this stuff and as we go through the temperature conversion example, take inventory about like what you can apply from this example to your homework assignment. Because that's an important thing to be able to do, to see what parts of the problem are similar and what parts of it are different. So the homework assignment is to do something like this. You will have ouch, think a text box with a number of coins. Then you'll have, and I'm not sure, let me actually, let me look it up. <laughs> Pardon me? Radio buttons. I wasn't sure if I said radio buttons or drop downs or if I was non specific about what to do. The drop down was like to choose a number of coins. Okay, the drop down to choose a number of coins. All right. And radio buttons to say the type of coin. So penny, nickel, dime, and quarter. And then Press a button, and it should show you the amount, you know, how many cents it works out to be, and it should show you that coin that many times. And I've supplied images of the coin. So if I pick five pennies, it should say five cents, and then show image of the penny five times. All right. So let's sort of take inventory right now and, and see what we covered and what we haven't covered. I think that's always important for students, but it's also important for experienced developers. When you look at a problem, it's like, well, what part of this do I sort of have an, an understanding of or do I have at least an idea? And then what part do I have no idea for? All right, we know how to click a button and to call a function. All right, so that's one thing that we know. We know how to point to things on the page. All right, because for this to work, we need to be able to point and, and get the value of the drop down and say how many coins there are. And we know how, to, and we need to know how to point to this and to say how to get that. Now, here's the thing, all right? We don't know how to do that for drop downs and radio buttons yet. When I say we don't know how to do it, I don't mean that you don't know how to do it. Maybe you've worked ahead or you've done some research or whatever. But I mean, we haven't covered an example in class of doing that. But we've done the similar thing for text boxes with the temperature. All right, so you can probably assume that the way that we're going to grab the value from here and the way we're going to grab the value from here is going to at least be similar. In other words, we're going to use a DOM to point to those things and we're going to then do something with some attribute. Now these aren't text boxes, so they might have different attributes than a text box, right? Because it's a different thing. Just like a fish has different characteristics than a bird. A text box has different characteristics than a checkbox or radio buttons or drop downs. But we know that they do have attributes. And we also know that you can use the DOM to point to anything on the page. All right. So this we don't know exactly how to do, but we probably should have at least somewhat of an idea. All right. The calculation of the amount. Let's put it this way. Once we figure out how to grab the value of the coin and what coin
coin we've chosen, calculating the value of those coins is probably no big deal, right? It's probably similar to our conversion from centigrade to Fahrenheit. It would be an expression like that. So that depends on us knowing how to do this. All right, so that's an unknown. Now, displaying the number of coins is, for the most part, an unknown. It's something that we haven't covered. All right? But we have covered one aspect of it, and that is we've covered the aspect of how to change the HTML of the page using the inner HTML attribute. That's relevant both for this and for this. All right? So if I were going to take inventory and, 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 and identify what are the biggest unknowns, at least what are the biggest things that we have not covered in this class, I would say, number one, grabbing the values from radio buttons, radio buttons and a drop down. That's an unknown. And we'll go over that example today. We'll go over an example of that today. All right. The other unknown is how to display an image a certain number of times. And that we'll either get into today or we'll get into Wednesday. And again, it's not like I'm going to go and do this precisely, you know, show, you know, show you the exact code to do it, but we'll do some sort of example that contains sort of the elements that you need to do that. All right. <laughs> So let me bring down the example where we left off on Wednesday last week, and let's enhance it. Here we go. Here's our file. One thing I will say is that you should test your code across browsers. JavaScript is one of those things that um, the DOM is handled slightly different across different browsers. So kind of like CSS, where CSS is something that you kind of need to test, especially if you're doing uh, some of the newer CSS things in CSS3. Or if you're doing some of the new HTML5 stuff, you want to test that across browser. JavaScript is another thing that you'd want to test across browser. So here we go. We can enter in the temperature, which, what was the temperature this morning? What, would, what How cold was it? Pardon me? Negative four. And that's negative 20 degrees centigrade. See, see, I like Fahrenheit better. It sounds even colder in centigrade. All right. To review this, first thing we have is we have an on-click event on the button. Remember, and this is important because we've sort of switched focuses sort of part way through this section where the first time we did validation we did it when the, when the form was submitting to a server-side script. Here, we're staying completely on the page. We're not going to the server, so we don't have a submit button. We have a button. It calls the method process form. Process form says do validation. If do validation, do calculation. Now, notice a couple things about this. And again, we talked about these last time, but just to review. 
First of all, I like this function because this is an event handler. In other words, this is, this is the code that handles when a certain event occurs, namely the clicking of the button. There's not a lot of code in the event handler. And that's a general characteristic, whether you're talking about ASP.NET or doing Android or iPhone. You don't necessarily want tons of code in there. You want it to sort of delegate to other things. That allows for writing code that is, is much more reusable. It, at least it offers a potential for that. All right. So, what does this if statement, if do validation, mean? Okay, exactly. We're going to, first of all, this indicates we're calling the function do validation. All right. There's no arguments to this function, and we may talk about arguments later on, but there's no arguments in this function, so we're calling the function. And this function is going to either return a true or a false. All right. True represents that it passed validation. False represents that it did not pass validation. So with, between the parentheses in an if statement <coughs> needs to be a Boolean. And a Boolean is an expression that evaluates to either true or false. All right. So I could say if x equals 1. And when you do a comparison, you use two equal signs. So I could say if x equals equals 1. That would be something that evaluates to a true or false. Because either x equals 1 or x doesn't equal 1. No, yes, no, and maybe. It's just it does or it doesn't. True or false. In this case, this is a true or false because this returns either a true or a false. Now, if you notice, I didn't finish the validation. And we talked about this last time. This is what's called a stub function. In other words, if I don't have time to finish something, you know, and my, my work day is ending, or I want to focus on another aspect of it, this allows me to sort of sketch out the code, all the pieces of the code, and not fill in everything, all, you know, until, until I'm ready to. All right, so this is a good technique to use where this function pretends no matter what that it's valid. All right. And if that's true, which in this case is always going to be true, we do calculation. And do calculation grabs a value from the text box. Document get element by ID. That's the DOM expression to point to that text box, grab its value, do the math on it, and then display the value on the page. So let's finish up the validation. There's nothing there. What am I going to do? I say if the get element by ID txt temp is equal to nothing, what do I do? Set the value to false. I probably also want to display something on the screen. Do I want to do a pop-up? Not really. No, it's not really the best way to do it. What I will do is, I could do this a couple different ways. I already have something called an, an ID of results. So I could go in and I could say, Results enter HTML equals must enter temperature. And I put it down there. And again, that might be a reasonable thing to do. Maybe I want to put it next to it and 
create a different div. We'll stick with this for now because this is a simple enough form that I'm not too worried about that. Now we talked about what we could do and, and, and how could we make this stand out. How could we make this stand out? Create an error class that makes it red, italics, whatever. And then apply that class to that element. So I'm going to go in here, I'm going to create a class that says air color red um, font size. Let's really be obnoxious and get in their face to am. Let's scream at them. What did I call my, I call my class class, yeah. I should call it error. And then what I can do is I can say document get element by ID results. Dot class name equals error. Now what can I do, now if I do put a value in, it's still like that. What, what should I do to fix that? Pardon me? Yeah, make a answer class or whatever you want to call it, a default class. in, we get the air. We put something in, we get the answer. Question. This class does not say, oh, yes, it does, never mind. Scratch that. Okay. Now, the other kind of air, of course, we could put in here is if it's garbage. All right. And we get the result of NAN, which means not a number. So, the way I could validate that is I could simply write a second condition. And I could do this a few different ways. I'm going to put an else on here. So if there's something in there, I'm going to look to see if there's a built in JavaScript function is NAN. It says if it is not a number, that will be true. If it is a number, that will be false. And I'm going to change the inner HTML to give a more specific error. All right? Because I'm testing more specific issues with that box. I, you know, I don't want to simply generically say there's a problem with that. I want to say that. You know, you must enter a number or whatever. Must 
I'll enter a number. I'll enter temperature. All right. Questions on any of this? Um, is there a way? Yes. Are there any other questions? Yeah, there is. Um, let's let's leave that. We'll, we'll come back to it. Um, remind me if we don't, if I forget. All right. What if we made it so that you could not just convert Fahrenheit to centigrade, but you could also convert centigrade to Fahrenheit? All right. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to put, I, I could do this a couple different ways. And in fact, I probably will do it a couple different ways. I'm going to start out by doing it with a radio button or, yeah, with a radio button. So we know what a radio button is. A radio button is a series of buttons for which only one can be checked. Does one have to be checked? No, one doesn't have to be checked. Unless you default the radio button, initially they'll all be unchecked. Once you have checked one, then you're trapped. That's why some of uh, some of the people in the C CISS 216 class with the pizza order form, they used a, a radio button to say, do you want pepperoni? Check it for yes. Well, guess what? If there's only one radio button in a group and you check it, you are stuck with pepperoni, all right? So you'd either have to make a yes or no button or use a checkbox or something like that. And I'm going to call this conversion type. And I'm going to put radio button. Input type equals radio. What other attributes do I need? Repeat that, please. It needs a name, a value, and an ID. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure if it absolutely needs all of those, but that would be a great idea to put all those in. All right? And we will put all those in. Why does it need a name? Why does the radio button need a name? Pardon me? Because everyone needs a name. That's true. Why does this have to have a name, though? Um, that is a possible answer. Um, we're going to use the ID, all right? So we would be able to get around the ID. Uh, get around not having a name, for example, on the text box because we're going to be using the ID. Now, the server needs a name, so that's one reason why it needs a name, but we're not going to the server here. All right. What would happen if I had radio buttons that had different names? Let me ask that question. The names are what connect radio buttons. Remember, the idea of a radio button is that you can only pick one of them. How does uh, One of them within a group. How do you define what constitutes a radio button group? You give them the same name. So in this case, remember I said oftentimes you have a name and an ID. For most form, con form controls, the name and the ID, will, you know, you could just make the same thing, just to keep it simple. But with radio buttons, they must not be the same thing. 
because the ID needs to be unique. And the name needs to be the same within a group. Otherwise, it won't work like a radio button. All right? So I'm going to give this a name of RB type. over the weekend. I'll give it an ID of and I'll give it a value of Fahrenheit to centigrade. Copy this, and I'll do centigrade to Fahrenheit. I have to keep it with the same name. I have to give it a different ID, and I have to give it a different value. So let's go and look at this. Now the radio button, the radio button works like a real radio button, right? Let me click refresh to start out. Notice that it starts out with none of them being checked. All right. But once I check one, I can't uncheck. I can't uncheck both. Um. If I gave them a different name, <coughs> pardon me, could check them both, right? Because we don't, it, the browser no longer sees those as being one radio button group. So the name is what ties the radio buttons together. Now, I'm going to cheat on the validation right this moment. I may go back and uncheat later, all right? But I'm going to cheat on the validation right now, and I'm going to say I'm going to give a default to Fahrenheit to centigrade, all right? I would assume, well, I'm assuming that the people visiting this page would need to do that more often. All right. Your default should be a real default. You shouldn't make a default in this case just so you don't have to write validation. All right, because you're lazy and you don't want to validate it. And why don't I have to write validation now? Well, because it's impossible to uncheck them both now. One of them has to be checked now that one of them is checked. So now, if I go and view this, it comes up with Fahrenheit to centigrade. It is impossible to uncheck both of them, no matter what I do. All right. So now I want to do the calculation. All right. Now, the calculation... Really, it's going to be almost the same. We're just going to do a little bit different formula here. All right. I'll change that to T. All right. So the only line that's going to be different is this line right here, right? Because I'm still going to grab the temperature from the text box. I'm still going to do some sort of calculation, and I'm still going to put the results in my inner HTML. The difference.
difference is, is what calculation that I do. So, how do we determine what radio button got checked? Look at the value. Excellent thought, but it's not correct. Why not? It's not correct because a radio button element always has the value, regardless of whether it's checked or not. So if I were to say, if get element by ID, RB type F dot value equals F to C, that statement is always going to be true because the value of this radio button is F to C. The value doesn't depend on whether it's checked or not, at least when we do client-side stuff. All right. So what we have to do instead is we have to ask the question, is it checked? All right. It's a different property. It's a property that we don't have for the name for, or the temperature, for example. So, here I'm going to say, I'm going to use the same get element by ID. The ID, I'm going to look at this radio button. So I'm going to look for RB type F to C. Dot checked. If Fahrenheit to centigrade is checked, then that's the formula. Otherwise, the formula is Fahrenheit. And then 
I'm going to add to this not always the word centigrade, but I'm going to add my label, and we should be in business. 212 degrees Fahrenheit to centigrade is 100 centigrade. 100 centigrade to Fahrenheit is 212 Fahrenheit. All right. Questions about what we have so far. So we've met a new property. We've met a new property um, called checked. It's a Boolean, right? because something is either checked or is not checked. So I don't have to say if checked equals true. I know that it can either be either checked or not checked. What other form control do you think would have a checked property? The checkbox. Right. That's pretty easy. So we could test both of them. We can test to see if they're checked. Can we validate a checkbox? Well, it depends on the kind of checkbox. Because a checkbox, if it's one of those checkboxes that say, do you agree to the terms and conditions, then yes, you could validate it. You can force, you can make sure that the person has checked it. But if it's a checkbox like, I want to be added to the mailing list, then you can't validate it because either it's checked or it's not checked. All right, so I, I mentioned before I sort of cheated, and I sort of put a default value here. All right. And again, you should put a default only when it makes sense to put a default. If I was doing a tuition calculation for Lorain County Community College, all right, I could probably default if there were radio buttons to in-county resident, right? Because probably most people that go here are in-county residents. Not saying that there are people from out of the county that go here, but most people probably belong to it. So it would be reasonable to say Lorraine County resident. All right. If I had a series of radio buttons for the major that you were taking, it probably wouldn't make sense to set a default, right? Because what's the default major of students taking here? I don't know. People take a lot of different majors, all right? So it wouldn't make sense to make a default. Now, what's the danger of setting a default when one is not really called for? Yeah, someone may carelessly not change it and check the wrong thing. So if there's any doubt, then, um, you know, if there's any doubt to whether it's a reasonable default, then, you know, you're better off um, not setting one. If you don't set a default and one is called for, well, then you're making people do a little more work than they need to, you know. Of course, I live in Lorain County. This is Lorain County Community College. All right. So, why do I have to, you know, gee, couldn't it sort of figure out that most of us live in Lorain County? Well, yeah. So, you have to decide that. Now, how am I going to validate this checkbox? Let's say I get rid of the default. So I get rid of that check property. So now, when I come to that page, nothing's checked. And if I click 111, which conversion is it going to do? Centigrade to Fahrenheit? Pardon me? It's going to do the second one, right? Why is it going to do the second one? Well, because look at how my code is structured. I look to see if Fahrenheit is, is checked. If it is checked, I do this calculation. Otherwise, I do this calculation. So Fahrenheit isn't checked, so it's going to go and do that calculation. So it's going to give me misleading results. All right? It did the centigrade to Fahrenheit. 
How can I validate? Um, you're real close. I would not make that an else statement. All right. Each control that I'm validating is going to have its own little segment of if statements. Right? Because I want to validate them independently. All right? And I always want to do the validation. All right? So, I want to write an if statement that says if neither of them are checked to do something. What do you suppose that if statement is going to look like? It's got the word if. It's got parentheses. And it's going to have that. And I want to put this down here. What do you suppose this is going to look like? I want to, you said it, you said it a second ago, check to see if neither of them are checked. What would be the condition to check if neither of them were checked? Yep. Exactly. So I could say if.
could concatenate. I could say, in other words, I could say must enter a number, maybe a comma or a semicolon, must choose conversion type. So how would I do that in this statement? I don't want to replace the inner HTML with must enter a conversion or must pick a conversion. I want to add that to the end of the inner HTML. How could I do that? Okay. Start off by having an error variable. So. What are we going to initialize it to? Let's initialize it to a blank. All right. If there's a problem with the first thing, what do we do? Error equals. Well, I could answer, but you know who's going to give us the definitive answer? The browser. All right. What do I? Okay, so I do that. If if I did not enter a temperature, I do this. If I entered a non-numeric temperature, I do this. What do I do here then? You want it to be enter HTML equals air plus plus pick conversion equals. Okay, enter HTML equals error. Is remember these two errors are mutually exclusive. You're not going to have this error and this error. All right. So yeah, you could do that, but you don't you don't have to do that. Whereas with this one, the errors are not mutually exclusive, so you have to do that. So let's try that. Uh, what, what's the last thing that we have to do?
or you know what? I'm not going to put a, a, a break tag in there. I'm going to could give a paragraph tag. Could give a paragraph tag. All of those really don't seem like paragraphs. I'm going to go. I'm going to put a span tag around each of them. section and you are a span, your display is black. Let's pick that, let's pick that. If I just put one of them in, and does that. Now, think about it here. We've actually done a lot here. We've picked a radio button, and we've picked the value of a radio button, and we've validated the value of a radio button. We have also done something similar, not, quite the, not exactly the same, but similar to this. Namely, we've put repeated things in an inner HTML. We've put other things in a. We have put more than one thing in the inner HTML. Now, to be sure, this is a little different because this we're going to do a specified number of times where this other one we did on a one-by-one -one basis, but we should sort of have a clue on how I could go and add more than one thing to the inner HTML without wiping out what was there before. All right, we'll continue on this example next time.